Hi, everyone. We will get started in just a minute. We're going to wait for a few more folks to join. All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Terp Family Chat. My name is Brian Watkins, and I am the Director of the Office of Parent and Family Affairs. I am glad to see so many of you join us this evening on Zoom and our YouTube channel. The session is being recorded. If you have a family member or friend who is unable to join, they can view the recording, which will be posted on the Terp Family YouTube page tomorrow. If you've not attended an orientation session and are unfamiliar with our office, I want to make sure you know that the Office of Parent and Family Affairs serves as the single point of contact at the university for the parents and family members of our undergraduate students. Consider us your home at the university. Our goal is to educate and engage all of you in becoming informed partners in your undergraduate students' education, personal development, and success. Turp Family Chat is our special summer online series designed to help the newest members of the Turp family prepare for fall semester. We recognize the many challenges presented by COVID-19 and we wanna share updates and timely information with you. The focus of tonight's session is being in community. You'll hear from several leaders in the Division of Student Affairs who will review recent updates provided by the university, especially regarding the first 14 days. And we will also discuss what it means to be in community in the midst of the pandemic, the expectations we have of each other as members of this community, and the steps we are taking to create community and a sense of belonging for students. Each of our speakers will share or review information with you. Our remaining time together will be spent answering your questions. And we welcome your questions. Please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. You can enable this by clicking the Q&A button located at the bottom of the Zoom window. You are welcome to submit questions as you think of them throughout the presentation. We'll monitor the questions as we go. We have some staff members who may answer them immediately in writing or we'll save them and ask them live during the Q&A portion. All of you can see the questions that others submit. If you see someone submit the same question you have, rather than repeat your question, I encourage you to click on the thumbs up icon under the question you like. This is called an upvote, and it will move the question up higher into the Q&A window so it gets more attention by us. With so many questions submitted, we will not be able to get to everyone's questions this evening. Let me unshare my screen. And to get it started, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Patty Perillo, Vice President for Student Affairs. Patty. Greetings, parents and families. It is good to be with you this evening. Um, as Brian said, my name is Patty Perillo and I serve as the Vice President for Student Affairs. I actually started my job here on January 21st. And on January 24th, we began our planning for COVID. And what I want to reassure you about is that since I started here in January, and it's my alma mater, so it was a coming home for me, there have been many, many, many groups of colleagues across this institution who have been thinking about the health, safety, and well being of all of our students, faculty, and staff. As many of you may know that we're here with us in the spring semester, we readily move to a fully online environment. And since we did that in March, we spent the last four or five months in a series of working groups thinking about the fall semester. And we are spending as much time as possible collecting as much information as possible from public health guidance, from the state of Maryland, from the health department in the county in which we're in, which is Prince George's County. We're very fortunate here at the University of Maryland to have one of the top rated schools of public health in the country. And our Dean, Dean Boris Luzniak is actually um, a former Deputy Surgeon General and actually served as a Surgeon General at one point, point in time. And so he has been a constant companion for us in helping us make decisions 
where we are constantly thinking about the health, safety, and welfare of our community. So we know that you and our students received lots of information yesterday, lots and lots of information. And I want you to know that there was much thought and much time and much effort put into making decisions about some next steps. Uh, president Pines, who just started with us in July as the president, he was Dean of the College of Engineering for a long time. He's been on this campus for 25 years and this is his home and his community and he takes great pride in, in leading this great institution because it's a place that he loves. And he's constantly collecting information and data and meeting a lot with the senior leadership team. So we have no less than three or four cabinet meetings each week. And I, as the vice president for student affairs, who have responsibility for about 14 departments. What I often say to colleagues and families and parents is that student affairs is um, anything outside the classroom except intercollegiate athletics is the division of student affairs. So we partner and journey with your students uh, the whole time that they are here. And we partner and journey with you. What we know is that you parents and families are really, really important um, to the success of our students. And so we wanna be your partner. We wanna be in relationship with you. We wanna be in connection with you. So we spent quite a bit of time over the last two weeks thinking about the university and what is the best decision for us. And we decided that at this point in time, what is best is for us to move to two weeks of online only education with the hopes that we are able to move into the hybrid model that we've been planning with all semester, actually all summer long. We've been planning for that all summer long. And so I just spent time right before this meeting, um, in fact, with a, a group of student leaders. I have a student leader advisory board and there are about 28 students that are in that group. And I think most, if not all of them showed for, for our gathering. And they asked a lot of questions, just like you might have. They're seeking information just like you are seeking information. And we're doing our best to provide the information. But what we spend a lot of time talking about on this call, in fact, your students are gonna get a video from these student leaders tomorrow and what we talked a lot about is how is it that we do all that we can to make sure that we normalize this new behavior, that we socialize students in the expectations of this new behavior. We do continue to send information out on all of our social media channels, as well as emails um, and all other kinds of ways in meetings with students to remind everybody in the community of what their responsibility is. Um, I have continued to say to students, we will stay the course this fall semester in many ways, dependent on the behaviors that you choose or don't choose to engage in. We're gonna take this very seriously. This is a matter of life and death and you all know that, there's no doubt about that. But we also have learned a lot over the last six months. We've learned a lot about COVID and coronavirus and how one contracts it and what we can do to make sure that we put all the measures in place as best as possible to keep people as safe and healthy as possible. So I feel very strongly as a leader on this campus, returning to my alma mater, that the leadership has done all that it can to put students in, envi in an environment that is as safe as possible. And again, it, much of it will depend on people's behavior and that includes students, faculty and staff. So we're trying to do all that we can to send a message. It was interesting, even when I spent time with the students on the call today, I said, let's welcome them back for the fall semester. And students said, be careful, don't be too excited because if you get too excited, they're gonna get all excited about coming back to College Park. Why don't we say to them what it is that we're committed to? So each of the students went around and said, I am committed to wearing my mask. I am committed to holding students accountable. I am committed to following guidelines. And so they wanted to demonstrate to our students what they are committed to as a way to model the way. And that's what you will continue to see and expect from our student leaders, which is really, really terrific. We continue to think about how is it that we invite people back to campus, which is what we wanna do, in a safe, as dense a way as possible, while still allowing for some community to happen, right? What we know about our students is that they are a part of a generation, um, that they're the loneliest generation that we've studied in a really long time. And so we wanna do all that we can to allow for community and a sense of belonging in ways that are as safe as possible. And some of my colleagues are gonna talk specifically about what we might be doing in the Stamp Student Union or in Resident Life or in RecWell, which is our Recreation and Wellness Center, about the things that we're trying to do virtually, at least for the first two weeks, and then beyond to create the kind of community that our Terrapins have come to know and have come to love. So thank you for being here. Your partnership matters. 
I'm really glad that you're a part of the Terrapin family. And I look forward to hearing your questions, responding to your questions, and listening to my colleagues offer some updates as well. Thank you for that, Patty. Next, I'm gonna turn things over to Andrea Goodwin, and Andrea serves as the Director of the Office of Student Conduct. Andrea. Thank you, Brian. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. I uh, wanna welcome you to the Terp family as well. Um, as Brian said, my name is Andrea Goodwin, and I serve as the Director in the Office of Student Conduct, um, but I'm also a parent of a college junior, so it wasn't very long ago that I was the anxious parent waiting for my son to start his freshman year, and he kept telling me over and over again to relax, um, but I do know that this fall is like no other fall that we've ever encountered before, so I want to reiterate that um, we are working really hard to prepare the campus so that students can have a safe and a successful and a really enjoyable semester. Um, for all of you family members, we understand that the health and safety of your student is your first priority and it's our most important priority as well. So we've put some systems in place to help us accomplish this. And as the Office of Student Conduct, it's our responsibility to hold students accountable and make sure that they're adhering to community expectations so that they can help keep everyone safe as well as themselves. Yesterday, I sent out a letter to all students um, to make sure that they understand what's required of them. Um, and I'd like to share some of what I told the students with you now, but if your uh, child has not um, read my letter, I encourage uh, you to read it with them so that they understand the expectations. Um, first, it's really important for you to know that the Code of Student Conduct applies to all students, both on and off campus. So in addition to the specific policies that are outlined in the Code of Student Conduct, all students are expected to comply with state, local, and federal guidelines as well. And we have shared with students that they have to comply with the following directives. They have to wear a face mask at all times, indoors, and also outdoors when they're in the presence of others. We are encouraging students to wash their hands frequently and practice good personal hygiene always. They also need to practice physical distancing by staying at least six apart from others. And we will encourage that in the classrooms and in all of the events that we have. We are telling students to please stay home if they're sick and wherever home is, if it's in the residence halls or if it's in their apartment off campus or even if it's their home at home, home away from home. <laughs> um, uh, please make sure that um, you report symptoms to the University Health Center and also to your personal doctor. And we're asking students to monitor their symptoms daily and submit them um, to the online reporting system. And we've shared that link with students. Um, I want to say a word a little bit about um, parties and large gatherings. Um, regardless of where students live, they have to adhere to the guidelines um, in Prince George's County. And Prince George's County has issued an executive order that says that um, uh, basically all parties or all gatherings, we don't um, necessarily call them parties, but gatherings are limited to 10 people, including the residents of the home in an average 2000 square foot single family home. So we are encouraging all of our students off campus to practice that. And we certainly encourage students who are visiting the campus or who are living on campus to adhere to that guideline as well. Um, and obviously if students are gathering together, they do need to wear their masks and physically distance. Um, something that may be new to our students and it is a little bit shocking because my son brought this up to me. Um, he said, Mom, he said, I got your letter, so I'm glad he read it. Um, but um, in College Park, there's an executive order that says that anybody who's um, hosting or attending a large party or gathering that's not in compliance with the executive order faces a $5,000 fine and can also be sentenced up to a year in jail in addition to or instead of that fine. And this is enforceable by Prince George's County. So that's not a university rule, but it's something that all students should be made aware of. 
Um, the university is also working really hard with businesses in the city of College Park to ensure that safety measures are implemented in local restaurants, in at all local establishments, um, shopping areas, um, and, and throughout the city of College Park. In terms of sanctions that students can face at the university, um, that falls within my office's responsibility, um, but um, students may face loss of privileges to attend campus events. They could face housing dismissal if they're not following guidelines within the residence halls. Um, they can be removed from all on-campus activities, including in-person classes. So students who are attending in-person classes must wear a mask and social distance or they'll be asked to leave the, the class. And if they refuse, then they can be dismissed from the class for the rest of the semester. And then obviously for egregious or repeated violations, students face possible dismissal from the university. Um, and I do want you to know that typically in our office, we focus, uh, focus on student discipline as an educational issue. We sit down, we talk with students, um, but as you can see, we are really serious about enforcing the code of student conduct because as Patty said, it's a matter of life or death. We will definitely update protocols to comply with state and local guidelines and we'll notify students as quickly as possible. And whenever a student is potentially in violation, we certainly will meet with them and listen to them. Um, but I do want to encourage all students who may be listening to make sure that you're familiar with the guidelines um, and with the expectations and parents to please, and parents and family members to please review that with the students. Um, so thank you so much for your attention and for your support. Uh, I know these are really challenging times, but I wish you all the best and welcome you to our TERP family. Thank you, Andrea. Now I'm going to turn it over to Mike Glowacki, the Chief of Staff in the Department of Resident Life. Thank you, Brian, and good evening, everybody. Uh, like Andrea, I'm a TERP parent as well. I have a, a fairly recent 2016 graduate uh, from University of Maryland, and uh, my youngest son is a, a rising junior as well. So I, I know what it's like to sit in your seats. Uh, in the residence halls, uh, we're all about building community. Uh, we describe the Maryland re residential experience as about the experience that students have primarily in their first two years on campus, um, taking advantage of the resources of living on campus, and one of the greatest resources is their diverse peers. Uh, people join us from all over the place, uh, around, around the world and from across the country. And um, the residence halls are a unique experience. I, I rarely uh, speak with parents and there's uh, not fond memories of what their experience was like. Uh, as everybody has said, it's gonna be a little bit different this year, um, but our staff are preparing uh, to make it a fun and exciting and enriching uh, and an experience of, of growth and learning. Uh, if you've ever participated in a residence hall move-in, whether here at Maryland or perhaps at another institution, it is probably the textbook example of not physical distancing. Um, when you come to Maryland uh, in a typical move-in, we're moving upwards of 9,000 students into 37 residence halls in about three and a half days. And we've actually gotten quite good at it. So logistics uh, are, are something that we do fairly well, but we've had to take a completely different approach this year. Um, the campus de-densification effort uh, has been real and it's been important. Uh, so we do have a smaller number of students to move in. Rather than three and a half days, we're doing it over about 15 days. Um, and so it will look very, very different. It'll be a different experience for you. Uh, let me tell you uh, a couple of key points on how you can help us. I'm, I'm focusing uh, my comments tonight mostly on, on the move-in process. Um, the things that you and your families can do to help us uh, most are to remember that all move-in is by appointment only. So we won't be able to just uh, open the doors if, if you show up and say, I'm here, can you, can you sign, can you check me in early? Uh, our appointment scheduler went up today. We got great response. Uh, so if your student hasn't yet scheduled a, an appointment, they should do that as soon as possible. Um, uh, number two is pack light. First, let me say, Every student, college student always brings too much stuff. That is, that is kind of the number one piece of advice I give in any year is uh, take a look at the stuff that you think you're gonna bring and cut it by 50%. This is a particularly important year for that. Um, uh, 
partially because it's so unknown. We don't know exactly what the semester holds for us. Uh, we are all hoping and working very diligently to try to make sure that we can have a full fall semester here, um, that students can um, participate and we can move through the first two weeks of, of online classes and, and move on to um, a fuller experience of hybrid and in-person instruction, but we simply don't know. And so if we reach a point in the semester where uh, the campus has to move to all online instruction and uh, we would, uh, students might be leaving the residence halls, you might have to do that with little notice. So um, please pack light. Um, Another thing is, is uh, that you can do to help us to maintain physical distancing is limit the helpers that come with the students to no more than two. Um, uh, a lot of families bring two, sometimes it's mom and dad, sometimes it's, it's other individuals. Some families like to bring grandma and brothers and sisters and everybody else. And, and this is unfortunately a year where uh, that can be um, uh, not only an unhelpful thing, but potentially a dangerous thing. So we're asking each student to limit, limit their helpers to mo no more than two. And then the last thing would be to make sure that everybody that participates in move in uh, follows our health and safety practices. One of my great fears is that folks are gonna grow numb to the idea of wear your mask, maintain six feet of distance, wash your hands frequently. But if we've learned anything over these months, those really are the keys for each of us. Each of us holds the key and the ability to keep ourselves healthy and safe if we follow those practices. So we can't grow numb to them. We have to remember that that is that is a, a key strategy to our own health and safety. Uh, like I said, many students have signed up for their uh, appointments. I think many of you know we have two options. One is called Set Up and Go. Uh, we think that's the preferred option for anybody who, uh, who can handle that or who lives close enough. Uh, in Set Up and Go, you will schedule an appointment between August 16th and 22nd uh, to, to come to campus with relatively a small number of other folks, uh, particularly in your assigned building. Um, you'll have several hours uh, to uh, bring most of the belongings, set up the room, uh, spend a little time there, uh, get, get to know the facility a, a little bit, and then we'll ask the student and the helpers to return back home until uh, their arrival appointment for what we're calling a curbside drop-off. We've had a lot of questions about, uh, about that second arrival appointment today. You will receive, your student will receive information uh, as early as tomorrow with um, suggested times uh, for, for you, them to return. If for whatever reason that time doesn't work, please drop us a note and we can work out something else. Uh, the important part though, is that we wanna limit the interaction between families. So when you come back for that drop off, it really should be, the goodbye should be said uh, out in the uh, outside um, before the student goes into the building and that will help us spread the, uh, limit the spread of contagion. Um, uh, the setup and go period affords maximal uh, physical distancing because students who come on Monday will take care of their business, they'll get all, all set up in the room, and then they'll leave and they'll have no interactions with the students who come back on Tuesday and we'll move on through the week that way. Once students start to come to stay, which is uh, August 26th, Wednesday, then those students are here. So the students who come on Thursday, there are more students. So every parent that comes into the building uh, with a student on Thursday, then on Friday, then on Saturday, exposes not only themselves, but each other to, a, to just a additional uh, uh, potential exposure. So we're, so we're asking everybody to please do their part and um, uh, make that curbside drop off um, a reality. So those are kind of the things that, that we'll ask you to do to help. Logistically, uh, here's what'll happen. All check-ins will occur, uh, start at Xfinity Center. Uh, and we're kind of excited about this possibility. Um, it's, a, it's a practical reason why we're doing it. There are several things that have to happen this year that don't ordinarily happen at move-in. So ordinarily over the summer, when you come for orientation, you would do things like sit for a photo for your student ID and get your ID uh, provided to you. You would uh, do dining services, has, has a biometric scan that initiates the meal plan in the dining hall. So those things weren't possible at summer orientation this year. So we've added those uh, to the check-in process. So we'll be on the 200 level concourse of Xfinity. It's a fun environment uh, in which to arrive. Uh, so we'll ask families to park in Terrapin Trail Garage. Uh, we ask families to stay with the car, the helpers to stay with the car and only the students uh, to go into Xfinity Center. They'll make hopefully a quick lap around the concourse to do those three things, ID, dining services, bio scan, and pick up the residence hall keys if they're a new incoming student. If they're a returning student, they can skip the first two and they'll go immediately to our resident life table and pick up their keys. 
and then you'll be on your way. Uh, we're going to provide this week to your student something called a passport. That's a, it's a sheet of paper that they'll download that'll have a lot of good information on it. It will um, have parking information. It'll have directions to get from Xfinity uh, to, the, to the assigned building. And so that'll be a really useful, useful thing. You'll uh, meet back at the car, navigate uh, to your assigned building, um, and then uh, it begins to look more like a regular check-in. The way we've managed to move a lot of people in, in a small space, relatively small space, in a relatively short amount of time um, is by using unloading zones. So you pull up close to your building, uh, you spring into action, everybody hops out of the car uh, and unloads the belongings onto the sidewalk. One member of the party will move the car to a longer term parking space. Um, the others will wait there with the belongings. Everybody meets back up and then you move belongings into the building. Uh, we will have uh, some moving carts available. Um, it's important to understand that we won't have staff there disinfecting them between uses. So we urge you to bring gloves, wipes, anything that you would want to, uh, to clean off a, a plastic laundry style cart that is helpful with moving, moving things around. Um, uh, we ask that we limit elevators in buildings with elevators to no more than one family at a time. So be on the elevator with your family. So that might mean a, a few extra minutes wait, but again, the small numbers of check-ins at any one time should make that very manageable and very reasonable. Um, Particularly if you're doing a setup and go, it's going to feel unusual to you. Uh, that's a feature, not a bug, um, because in a high-rise building that might typically hold 500 residents, but this year will hold 270 residents, there may be only eight or 10 students moving in with one or two helpers at a time. Um, we will have staff strategically placed. We'll have uh, operator standing by, so there'll be a phone number posted on most doors, and we'll give you that phone number at check-in, so that if you have questions, you run into a problem, uh, we'll be able to support you as, as you finish your move-in. So um, that's, that's, that's the big picture on move-in, and I'll turn it back over to Brian. Thank you, Mike. Now I'm turning it over to Marshla Gensler-Stevens, the uh, director of the Adele H. Stamp Student Union. Hey friends, welcome to the Adele H. Stamp Student Union. I'm in my office tonight and my friends are laughing right now because if you live in a Zoom world, you know that you have to unmute. And I, I'm not a very muted person, but for some reason that, that mute button has me at hello. So I, I wanna just say, welcome. I'm sitting in my office right now, literally at a Dell stamp desk, which means it's a very old piece of furniture. And this building is eerily quiet. We opened two weeks ago um, and it was a long time a coming. And, we are so grateful to have folks coming in now. And I invite you if you're in College Park in the coming weeks before or when you go visit Mike Lewacki and his good colleagues in resident life that you swing on by and, and grab a bite to eat or a, 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 an, an ice cream cone because the dairy is open or buy your books because we are here. Um, I, I wanna just talk to you briefly about what I think the fall will look like for you and your student and the sense of excitement we have. I have to tell you, our sort of motto that's in our head is transforming your Maryland experience. We want to make sure when your student gets here um, that it is just this enriching environment where you have a chance to both learn in and outside of the classroom, where you, you feel this great sense of community and how you belong to some group, any group, or a group. Um, and that in some ways you question who you are the whole way through college and arrive at the other side with a greater sense of all your strengths and your leadership and the way in which you can be a, a true change agent. So we're gonna work to make that happen in this odd and wonderful world in which we live in. And we're gonna do that in part because there are really amazing caring people in our world, both staff and student staff, but also student leaders who will join us in that effort. There are about 800 student groups. And in a normal fall, you'd see a great display three weeks into school in the middle of McKeldin Mall with 
sweaty students sharing with you all the amazing things that student groups have to offer. We won't exactly have that. It'll be virtual. You can still sweat if you prefer, but it is gonna be an amazing chance to see what is it you have an interest in that maybe was cultivated in your prior school or in high school or in life? And how do you find those same interests? Or what have you always wanted to explore that you've never had a chance to explore? And one of the things we're doing is equipping student groups to play that really critical role in the lives of all students of engaging students, sort of welcoming them warmly into the kind of things they might do both virtually and uh, in person in small numbers. So you'll get a chance to do a thing called the First Look Fair a few weeks in. They'll explore those 800 different student groups, but you can start that exploration now. If you just go to on the STAMP website, you can see all the opportunities that exist. Physically, after we get through the first two weeks, the STAMP is gonna look pretty similar every day. You're gonna have an opportunity to be reminded like your mom might remind you with a list of symptoms on our door that says, hey, how are you feeling today? And you'll take a look at that and then you'll just swipe your ID and come on in. And what awaits you when you come in is a wide variety of food options where you'll get a chance to have a snack and or a meal. And uh, you'll get a chance to use one of our comfortable chairs to physically distance lounge. There are places to study, places to take your class when you don't wanna take it anymore in your residence hall room. You'll get a chance to explore opportunities with our staff and find them as guides and mentors and cheerleaders. So there will be a there there in that physical space. Those first 14 days, you will have an opportunity to come to the stamp, but you'll reserve a spot so that we have a sort of a lower, smaller group of people taking advantage. And we won't have everything open, but it'll give you a chance to go to the bookstore, which has just gone through a million dollar renovation and you can get your textbooks or the shirt you wanna wear for two weeks or the really cool school supplies you need. You'll get a chance to get some food and carry it out and take it back with you. You'll get a chance to merely take a wander and uh, be tantalized by all the stuff that'll exist for you in 14 days. But we don't want you to just sit around waiting for the world to happen. So there'll be lots of virtual activities starting from the get-go. Everything from on the 30th, when you get a chance to go to the president's welcome on Sunday evening. And in the first 14 days, you'll find that there's a little bit of everything going on, competitive games. There's a really big concert on the 12th. Who knew you could go to a concert simply sitting in your sweats at your desk? There'll be lots of ways in which you'll be um, engaged to do things like virtually tutor students in the Prince George's County schools. The Latinx welcome will happen in that very first weekend. If that is something that really plays to one of your identities, that will be great to attend. You'll get a chance to meet some of our colleagues in places like Studio A or the gallery who'll give you art projects to do while you await the end of those 14 days. And then they'll want you to come in and take a pottery class or work in our dark room or go to the gallery or play billiards, or go bowling. There'll be ways in which you can be in small communities or by yourself or with a special friend, all of that because we want you to be a part of our family. We're gonna communicate with you regularly, but we're also gonna enrich our website, it already is. There'll be lots of ways in which we're trying to communicate out to you, but you should communicate right back to us. So today I met a really cool dad and his son. They bought five, count them, five bags of Maryland wear today. Um, they'll be coming back, moving in to residence halls, but they wanted to come and shop early. So they got the best merchandise. They're excited about school, both the dad and his son. I was just glad to see them. I think I, I might've overwhelmed them with my hospitality, but I could remain physically distant with my mask on. I want you to know, we wanna be here for you. We're here for you, whether that's virtual or real. We're a part of your Maryland experience. We will be your Kickstarter to so many ways in which you wanna be engaged. And um, reach out to me, my email's right on the website in the stamp. If I can help you before you get here, I'm, I'm your person. So thanks a bundle for making Maryland home. Um, come to the stamp often, we're here for you. Thank you for that, Marsha. Our next guest speaker is Matt Supple, the Director of Fraternity and Sorority Life. Matt. Thanks, Brian. 
welcome parents and family members and uh, perhaps students. We appreciate you joining us this evening and certainly Brian appreciate you and the Parent and Family Affairs programs for putting these on. I just wanted to say that over the last several weeks, I have talked to dozens and dozens of parents already with questions about fraternity and sorority life on campus. What will it look like, especially around housing? I've been doing a little bit of monitoring of the Q&A and of the 142 questions asked. I have yet to see one come across for about fraternities and sororities. So I'll just spend maybe 60 seconds or so giving folks a little bit of an understanding of what's happening in fraternity and sorority life. And then I'll turn it over to uh, my colleague, Andrea, and let her get on with the recreation and wellness updates. So this is my 27th year at the University of Maryland, all working with fraternity and sorority life. And that has gone by really quickly. But as Dr. Goodwin said at the very beginning, there is uh, no fall like the current fall semester. And so I just want to let folks know we've got about 20% of our undergraduate population who joins fraternities and sororities. So that's about 4,500 members. We have 54 recognized fraternity and sorority chapters, but only about 33% of those people live in a traditional fraternity or sorority house. Uh, and we'll be coming back to our housed chapters at about 40% about 40 occupancy. So I just wanted to put some um, general facts out there and then let folks know if you've got questions about recruitment, how that process will look, social gatherings and parties. Again, Dr. Goodwin talked about that at the very beginning. Um, our expectation is that students will continue to abide by the six feet physical distance, that they will wear face coverings at all times, and that there will be fewer than 10 people gathered together. And chapters or organizations, whether those are fraternities and sororities or other student groups that uh, were among the 800 and some that Marcia mentioned, those folks will be addressed appropriately. We'll be working with the undergraduate chapter leadership and student organization leadership to help encourage them to have their own accountability measures in place. And then we'll work with the Office of Student Conduct to process whatever um, violations there might be. So with that, I'm just going to wrap it up and continue to try and monitor the Q&A and turn it over to Andrea. Thank you, Matt. As Matt said, I'm Andrea Bussler. I'm the Associate Director for Facilities with the University of Recreation and Wellness. And in RecWell, we are known for inspiring Terps to be active and live well. And we have been doing a lot of virtual programming to stay connected to our students, but we are open now. We have reopened our doors in some of our spaces. Uh, we op opened the golf course back in May and it has been going amazing. People have been so happy to be back out golfing. Uh, last Monday, we reopened our 260,000 square foot Epley Recreation Center, our outdoor aquatic center, and our outdoor challenge course with our climbing wall. Um, and we've been seeing about 150 to 170 people coming through a day. And it's been a great opportunity for us to work with some of our student employees, uh, get down our new practices, our new procedures, and our new way that we're bringing people into our spaces. So we're excited to open the doors to the campus community here when we open in the fall semester. But we have only done that with a lot of significant changes. Um, we've done a lot of efforts to de-densify um, our buildings and our spaces. And I would like to show you a couple of pictures uh, to give you an idea of what some of our spaces look like if we could. So this is the this is the Epley Recreation Center. And within this space, as you can see, we have dumbbells on our gym floor. Um, so we have taken a lot of our equipment and we have spread it out across multiple spaces. Um, and we've done this so that people can work out um, with safe distances um, greater than what the CDC recommends. Uh, we've reduced our capacities in these spaces, um, but also want to just have it be comfortable for students to be in there along with our, our faculty and staff that might be using the spaces. Uh, the lower pictures that you see are functional training equipment. We have also taken out some of our equipment that we can't easily clean. Um, so we've taken a lot of measures to try to make um, the space be uh, less, less equipment um, to get in the way, uh, less things that people have to worry about cleaning and disinfecting. We do have disinfectant that we'll have available for patrons to use. We do expect that patrons will be cleaning behind themselves, um, as well as our staff will be cleaning um, behind 
every, every two hours within our activity spaces. Our cardio equipment typically um, is stationed in one space within the facility. And that is now spread out across a gym floor as well. Um, and you can see that on the next slide. So you can see that we've moved, we have a lot of cardio equipment for a large campus and that's been spread out across a gym floor. Um, our fitness classes will take up another gym space so that they're in large open spaces and, and giving participants much more than the required um, six feet. Um, they're actually over 12 feet spread apart. Uh, so those classes will take place in either large gym spaces or outdoors. Um, we've also found that our virtual offerings have been very successful. And so while it's great to have the in-person classes, um, and I think that will provide great community for students and an opportunity to be taking classes uh, with friends, but at appropriate physical distances, they still have the option to do it virtually if they choose to do that in their residence. Our indoor and outdoor pools, we have a lot of lanes to accommodate our swimmers, but we have a lot of deck space. Our outdoor pool tends to be a very popular place for students to come and gather. And with the space that we have, uh, we have lounge chairs that we've, we've spread out that they can still do that in a safe manner. So we've taken advantage of the large spaces that we have in our buildings to be able to still have the in-person activities. And we're looking forward to having the, the students come back into our spaces. Um, some other programs that will still be occurring are our adventure programs. Uh, we have a large climbing wall, which is outdoors. Uh, we will also offer local day trips where students can um, go on a trip that's led by our students to local areas. Uh, if they feel more comfortable being on their own, they can come and check out equipment from our curbside rental um, and explore on their own. And we'll still use some of our virtual escape rooms and team building for those community efforts where virtual is just the better option. Uh, we still will have some intramural sports, but reducing that to low risk in-person activities. Um, so we'll go away from the team activities like basketball or volleyball, um, but offer other low risk activities that can still be done in person. Uh, we'll offer our virtual programming through eSports, um, which has been very popular and a great way for students to stay connected uh, through the last few months. And one of our features with intramural sports is we do a lot of late night programming. We know that our students, they like the late night activities. We have a lot of spaces where they can be um, outdoors under the lights um, and that provides a good opportunity to give the physical distancing in an outdoor location. Club sports, uh, we have over 45 club sports where students can um, meet others, participate in activities that they did in high school and want to continue or to try a new sport. Uh, but we can't do a lot of those activities as a team sport or competing against other universities like we would traditionally do, but we're still going to be offering them the spaces to get together as a, as a team, to work on their skill development, and also just to work out together. Our student employees will have over 300 student employees. We are hiring student employees to help us um, to be engaged with your students as they come in, to answer questions, uh, to help um, answer how we are doing everything in this new environment. Um, and our student employees, they're their own community. Um, they enjoy meeting friends and, and working together. Some significant changes that you'll see in our, in our facilities, obviously the face coverings are required and that includes while you're working out. Uh, we've reduced our capacities and we're requiring reservations. And your students can go to our website and they can make their reservations through our website or they can put an app on their phone and get reservations for the spaces. We're only offering the low to moderate risk activities. Uh, so there will be some limitations in what we can offer uh, in order that we can meet guidelines. Um, one of our uh, features is that we are only open to the campus community as we start. Um, so our priority is our students and our campus community. Uh, where we would typically offer guest passes and bring in the, in the outside community, we are holding off on that to start so that we can be there for our campus community first. So we're here to help you be active and live well, and we're looking forward to seeing your students coming into our facilities. Thank you, Andrea. And thanks everyone for the information you presented. It's just been so incredibly helpful. Uh, we have had lots of questions submitted, so we will do our best to work our way through many of those. But um, let's talk 
visits. Um, let's talk about uh, family members that want to visit campus to see their student and students who might want to head home for a visit with family on a weekend. Um, what are the recommendations as, as we know them today? And who would like to take that? <laughs> Mike, thank you. I, 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 can, I can speak to residence hall students. Um, every student had to sign an addendum to our housing agreement that, that spoke to some travel issues. Um, the, the best advice is for students to eliminate all non-essential travel. That's the safest thing. Um, uh, travel brings uh, several potential risks, depending on the mode of travel, where you go, what you do when you get there. Um, we recognize that students are going to have reasons uh, to leave for camp leave campus occasionally for the weekends, and and of course, um, uh, there won't be resident life staff members there, kind of uh, accounting for every student's whereabouts. Uh, but the safest thing to do is for everybody to eliminate as much as they can all non-essential travel. Uh, in our housing uh, addendum, uh, we do have a clause that says if you choose to go home for Thanksgiving break. Um, that you should plan on staying there to finish out the semester online. Um, uh, and that just is in recognition of Thanksgiving as the biggest travel holiday uh, of the year, the biggest travel weekend of the year. And so in an attempt to uh, not send, have a, a large number of students uh, dispersed to a lot of different places and then, and then come back to campus with the potential uh, to spread contagion, uh, in, in the last days of, of the fall semester, uh, we're asking that if students do choose to go home over Thanksgiving, that they'll plan to uh, stay there to finish the semester. That being said, Thanksgiving still feels a really long way away, and uh, there's many parts of the story probably still to be written. So the important thing will be to watch for guidance uh, as we move through the fall semester. Thank you. So, um, Patty, I'm going to uh, ask this of you. Um, you know, we, we have new guidance about the first 14 days. We're asking students to um, not, not interact with others and to, and to just hunker down for that time period. But, um, you know, if they're, if they're uh, grabbing a meal from the dining hall and, and on their way back to their room, you know, is it possible for them to find a grassy spot and enjoy their meal outside? I mean, what you know, can you just speak to some of the parameters around what we're what we're asking and expecting? Sure. You know, we've spent a lot of time on my leadership team talking about not just telling students what they can't do, but certainly telling students what they can do and what they should do. And and we're going to continue to do that. There is no doubt about that. The director of our health center, Dr. Saker Bodison, really feels like, and we will do this um, very soon. Just can she feels like we need to continue to educate people about the CDC guidelines about how it is that you can by and large contract the virus, right? And it's really about distance and time, not being six feet away from somebody and being in their presence for more than 15 minutes if you're not six feet away from them. And that's where you know it causes people real concern. So yes, we're gonna send messages to students that if you go to the dining hall and do grab and go, Go sit outside, stay six feet away from each other and enjoy your lunch. If you've got a buddy and you wanna throw a Frisbee, go ahead and throw a, a Frisbee with them, right? But again, it's reminding them to wear a mask if necessary, to remain physically distant as possible, but to think about ways that they can come together and be in community with each other um, that will allow them to do it in the most safe and healthy ways. One of the things that we're really clear about is the reason we moved to this two week period, right? 14 day period, of limiting movement as best as possible, right? We were, um, the messages were really about trying to limit movement as best as possible. It didn't say you have to quarantine or you have to stay in your room. We talked about limiting movement as best as possible is because we wanna see in these 14 days um, how we do as a campus in terms of our testing, in terms of our isolation and quarantine spaces, in terms of student behavior, how it is that we as a campus can manage it. And we'll manage it best if there's limited movement, right? The hope is that we continue um, to stay the course as we had planned to, to allow for the hybrid learning beyond September 14th. And we will do that best if we have this two week period, this 14 day period to keep students um, in community, connected in ways that they can, 
Um, and you've heard all my colleagues talk about all the virtual things that they can do, or even schedule an appointment in RecWell if they, if they want to do that. There's lots of things that they can do, um, but they need to do it in ways that will create the safest environment for them. Thank you, Patty. Marsha, involvement is such a such an important part of the college experience. Can you talk about um, a little bit more about uh, First Look Fair and, and what kinds of steps students can take um, to really just be proactive and, and, and seek out those opportunities in this environment? Sure, it is never too early to start looking, right? And so um, a quick gander at uh, the website for the stamp will take you right to Terplink, which is our site where all our student groups are listed. You can study by category of student group. Let's say you love sports clubs. So you wanna hang out with Andrea and all her friends in Reckwell. You'll find a category of sports clubs, but you'll also find uh, faith and spirituality, service groups, um, I, I just talked with a student this morning who got really involved in Terpcon, which is for us a big uh, fundraiser, dance marathon to support children's hospitals. So there may be a cause that's true to your heart. So do a, a, a word search by those words or values or organizations that are of interest to you. Um, the First Look Fair will be on this platform that'll make you feel a little bit like you're walking around outside. and. All of our uh, groups when you're outside are kind of organized together like sports kinds of things or academic clubs or clubs that really get you out and in, in, in the community. And so you'll find ways to sort of seek and search. At the same time, we're really asking our student leaders and engaged students already to be looking for you. Uh, and so, you know, that may be in the form of an RA who shares with you something they're really interested in. It may be one of our chaplains and the sort of way in which faith traditions uh, support your engagement. It also may be that you just meet someone in a online uh, classroom or competition. So uh, don't be afraid to do that searching before you get here. But then our staff will also have virtual office hours in those first two weeks to help you find your way. So we can help you with that sel selection and or search um, anytime, including now. Thank you, Marsha. I'm gonna keep you in the hot seat for just a minute. Can you speak more about books? Oh, and absolutely, absolutely. That process. So uh, we have a real commitment to try trying to find the most affordable way for you to get class materials and books. And some of you may be a really good ebook user, and that's certainly a great option. You can rent books, which is almost 90% cheaper than buying the book. You can rent used or new or buy used or new. You can begin to buy those books now, right? And so you can do that online and have them delivered to your home. You can buy them when you come to do that stop and drop with the good folks in resident life. You can come on in and get your books then. Uh, you can uh, do that during that first two weeks, right? When, when you just make a reservation, come on in, the bookstore will be open and you can pick those up or have them boxed up for you, ready to pick up, right? So you don't have to go during any of the searches. Uh, the other piece is that our folks are gonna help you find you know, the best way. One way you can get your books is uh, to purchase them and charge them to your student account. That's an option, right? And so, uh, we'll figure out with you the best way to do this sort of transaction um, that you have. And um, we have all that listing on Testudo now. If you go to class schedule, you can see what books are required or what books are suggested for your classes. And then we can take it from there uh, right to the University Book Center site. Thank you, Marsha. So Patty, I'm gonna go back to you. Uh, you know, if we had a magic ball, this would be an easy question to answer. But um, you know, there there have been several questions about threshold. What you know, what is the what is the threshold? What's the tipping point with um, you know test results that we that we get about any member of our campus community that would change the direction that we go post September 14th or at any point this fall? Sure. So one of the things we talked about just yesterday at the president's cabinet meeting is. Um, identifying this, this threshold. And I'll, I'll share some things with you. We also this morning, just so you know, with all of the directors in the Division of Student Affairs, um, 14 directors that lead departments, some of them on this call right now, 
and some of our what I call our Division of Student Affairs response team. Like there's a, a group that's looking at compliance, a group that's looking at testing, uh, a group that's looking at quarantine and isolation. We spent time today with our emergency management team doing a tabletop exercise um, to get really clear about where are there gaps and we need to shore up and what might be some of the tipping points for us. What we talked about in the president's cabinet meeting is that during the week of September 7th, um, likely towards the end of that week, we will make sure that we let folks know um, what's happening next. We wanna use the two weeks, at least eight days or 10 days to capture as much data as possible to make an informed decision about next steps. There is no doubt that all of us here want us to move into the hybrid model that we've been planning all summer long. And that is what we wanna do. But there are a series of things that we're gonna to have to pay attention to. So um, messages from the state, right? What, what is the positivity rate in the state? Even more importantly is what's the positivity rate in Prince George's County? You know, that's where we sit in Prince George's County and it, it's happened to be the, an epicenter in the, in the state. And so we have to pay attention to that. We are in, I'm in almost daily, if not every other day contact with the Prince George's County medical health officer about what's happening in the county. And what we know is that in a pandemic, at any point in time, Prince George's County leadership can say, University of Maryland, you have to change course, right? So some of that can be dictated outside of the university. But for us, really, what some of the measures that we're looking at, in addition to the Prince George's County positivity rate, we're gonna look at the positivity rate on our own campus. So as you know, we're asking all students to be tested before they come, because it's our hope that if anybody is positive, they're able to stay home, stay well, isolate with their families, and then come to campus as a way for us to not allow for positive cases to come to campus immediately. We're gonna test as soon as they are here, the same for faculty and staff. And we're gonna get a sense of our positivity rate. Um, that is gonna be really important for us. So looking at that positivity rate, but having enough days to do the testing for us to get a sense of the positivity rate, that will be important. Looking at our isolation and quarantine spaces. We need to make sure that we have enough of those spaces to manage um, anyone who was ill or anyone who could be because they were around somebody who was ill. So they really are the primary factors for us that we're gonna look at in making decisions about some next steps. Just for y'all to know that in Prince George's County, the positivity rate is about 6%. But as we've been testing, we're the only school in the state of Maryland system that has been testing members of our community in an ongoing way. We had big testing days in June, in July, and also early this month. And we continue to test at about a 1% to 2% positivity rate. But we then need to see what happens when we bring people from other states into the county. What is that going to do to our positivity rate? So that's going to be the big one for us. But again, we will be in communication with you as soon as possible. Um, and signal to you earlier than the actual date when is when it is that we will make a decision. Thank you, Patty. I'm mindful of our time, and and you know, as we started this, I I, I noted that we there would not be a way that we could work our way through everyone's questions, but I do want to note that um, several of the questions that I've I've seen are answered on the for Maryland website. So I dropped the link in the chat window. You'll see it there. It's umd.edu slash the number four and then Maryland. Uh, the announcements that get sent to students and uh, to the university community are posted on this website. And we also, uh, any messages that are sent to students, we also share with our parents and families on our Terp Family eConnection portal. Uh, and so we, we try very hard to get that information out to you as quickly as possible with uh, through our announcement and update feature. Uh, if you're not receiving that information, uh, we want to make sure that you do. Uh, so know that you can sign up for that anytime. And I'm going to ask Danielle to uh, drop the link uh, to that as well in the chat. So you'll see that in just a minute. Um, so if you are not getting information from us, um, again, please sign up for the portal. Um, it's free. Uh, and it's a great way for us to, to keep in touch with you. Um, I want to share one more final slide with you so you know how to uh, contact our office. So 
So this is the uh, contact information for Parent and Family Affairs. And please do not hesitate to reach out if you need anything. Uh, rather than share an email address for all of the offices represented tonight, uh, I'm sharing the email for Parent and Family Affairs. So if you have any questions related to anything that you've heard tonight, or you have questions about other things, uh, please send us an email, terpfamily at umd.edu. Hopefully that's really easy to remember. Uh, just remember that you're part of the Terp family and that's our email address. Um, and, and we will make sure that we get back to you as quickly as, as we can. And if we don't have the answer in our office, we're gonna do our best to put you in touch with someone at the university who can be helpful to you and most importantly to your student. This ends our Terp family chat. Uh, we are uh, really grateful that you could spend time with us this evening. And I wanna give a special thanks to my wonderful colleagues for the information they shared. Um, again, reach out if you need anything and uh, we appreciate you very much and wish you all the best in the next few weeks as you and your family make the transition to the University of Maryland. So again, welcome to the Turp family.